So uh, welcome everyone uh, to this um, um, to this parallel uh, session um, to this uh, um, <laughs> evolution phylogeny and population genetic session. So my name is uh, is Gwenel Bondono. I'm a postdoctor I'm a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the deep, uh, in Romance Arguello team in the Department of Ecology and Evolution in Lausanne, and I'm working on the birth of olfactory receptors in uh, several Drosophila species. Oh, hello. Um, I, I didn't realize that Gwen was waiting for me. Sorry about this. Um, my name's Timothy Vaughan. I'm, a, um, I'm also co-chairing the session. Um, and um, I'm, work, I'm a uh, postdoc as well. I'm with um, uh, Professor Sh Tanya Stadler at uh, the ETH Zurich um, in her computational evolution group. Um, we develop uh, methods um, and apply methods for phylogenomic inference uh, from um, uh, uh, genetic sequences, uh, wherever they come from. Okay, so before starting, just a few reminders about how this is going to work. Uh, so um, I will uh, introduce speakers and they will uh, make their, their talks and you will be able to ask them several questions. You have, uh, if you see in your Zoom, in your Zoom um, window, you have a Q&A uh, icon, so you can uh, ask your questions there. Please um, remind the name of the, the speakers you want to ask your question to. It's for us to keep track of the different questions. Uh, we, we will probably be short in time to ask questions to all the speakers, but you can upvote to your favorite questions and we will try to find time to ask these questions. And uh, we will keep all the questions then for the meet the speakers uh, part. So uh, let, let's start uh, this uh, session with uh, Natalia Zayak from the group of Christoph Decimals, who is going to, to explain us how, uh, how gene duplication and gain in atrio phallophorus winter bourne and other major parasitic trematodes contributes to adaptation. Thank you for this introduction. I'm going to just share my screen. Can you see everything? Is it fine? So welcome everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to be here. Um, today, I want to talk to you about gene duplication and gain in Atrophalophorus winterborni and other major parasitic trematodes and how it contributes to adaptation to parasitism. Uh, I'm Natalia and I'm a PhD student at ETH Zurich um, with Yuka Yokola, but uh, this work was done in collaboration and under leadership of Natasha Glover from University of Lausanne in uh, Christoph Decimus group. So our focal organism um, is Atrophalophorus winterborni. It's a trematode worm um, that is native to the South Island of New Zealand. Um, it alternates between two hosts in its life cycle, a aquatic snail, Potamophorgus antibodarum, and so after sequencing the reference genome, um, we carried out a comparative genomic analysis um, of, the, of our focal trematode to other trematodes using OMA standalone. Um, OMA is a software for inference of hierarchical orthologous groups uh, of genes shared between species um, and establishing phylogenetic relationship between species. And that's what we did for, um, for the trematodes. So maybe first an introduction to what hierarchical orthologous groups are. These are sets of genes that have descended from a common ancestral gene in a taxonomic range of interest. So to illustrate it on an insulin gene, um, if you consider um, the insulin genes um, among rodents, you have two hogs because there occurred a duplication before the speciation of, of, uh, of the rat and the mouse. But if you consider the insulin gene among um, uh, all mammals, including humans and rodents, you can see that um, these genes that we see today have descended from, from the common 
from a common single uh, ancestral gene. And that's why they are encompassed in one hog. So that is what we did for our species. Um, we chose, in order to accurately reconstruct the hogs, we chose three outgroups, um, two free-living nematodes, um, and four species of parasitic platyhelminths that are most, most closely related to trematodes from the groups of monogenea and cestoda. And we've, chose four, we've chosen 14 species of trematodes um, for our analysis uh, from the uh, suborders of Diplostomida and Plagiorchida. And um, these species have been chosen because their genomes are well studied. They are trematodes that infect humans and cause um, human diseases. So schistosoma cause schistosomiasis, for example, and Plagiorchida are liver flukes um, that infect humans. Um, and among those is our Atrophilophorus winterborni. So uh, after reconstruction of the hierarchical orthologous groups, we use PIHAM for reconstruction of ancestral genomes at each stage of the phylogeny. And so we compared um, uh, each ancestral and extant uh, the extant genomes to reconstruct the ancestral genomes and infer the duplicated um, the gained and the retained genes along each branch of the phylogeny. So the retained genes are one-to-one -one orthologous genes, um, and then the duplicated gain genes um, are those that have increased in numbers or have appeared in different um, stages of, uh, of evolution. So here on this uh, tree, you can see the gained genes only indicated for the parts of the phylogeny that we were most interested in. Um, due to the fact that, um, that these stages lead to the extant genome of Atrophilophorus we see today. And um, our analysis mostly focused on three ancestral genomes, the ancestral trematode, ancestral pragyorchida genome, ancestral xifidiata opistochiata genome, and the um, extant genome of Atrophilophorus. Um, we observed the changes in gained and, and in gained and duplicated genes mostly because these have been indicated in literature to be most important in adaptation to parasitism uh, for other parasites, for other trematodes, um, because um, unlike you may associate gene loss um, with parasites, um, however, for complex parasites such as trematodes that have seven stages in its life cycle and multiple hosts, um, novelty is the key resource in adaptation. So um, we characterize these genes, the retained, the duplicated, and gained, and we perform the go-enrichment analysis using GOA tools to functionally characterize these genes and understand what changes occurred along the phylogeny to, um, to understand what are the most recent changes that created, that made Atrophilophorus different from the other trematodes. I don't have time to talk about all of these genes today, but um, I want to focus on, on the genes that arose uh, in Atrophilophorus winterborni through duplication, actually through most recent duplication from the Xifidata opistorchiata ancestor. 24% um, of the genome has originated through the most recent duplication events. And um, among those genes, there are 13 hogs with more than 10 duplications. Um, two families, uh, two gene families or two hogs have attracted our attention most because um, they had more than 30 genes from Atrophilophorus winterborni. And these included a glutamine synthase um, hog um, and a metallohydrolase glycoprotease family. We used CODML to uh, detect signatures of positive selection uh, along uh, the branches of the gene trees. Um, of these gene families, and we detected um, that uh, 13 genes of Atrophilophorus winterborni is under positive selection in the first family, and all of the genes in the second hog are, under, uh, are evolving under positive selection. Um, we focused our analysis on the second family uh, because of that result, and we um, reconstructed, so we did structural analysis of the protein that the gene family creates, and we colored the sites of the protein by the probability of being under positive selection. And we found two, four sites with a probability of greater than 95% of um, being under positive selection, and two of these um, are DNA binding sites. But you might still be wondering, 
um, what do these, how do these um, families might be contributing to adaptation to parasitism? Is there any, um, any underlying um, literature background that shows that these, um, these genes might be involved in any functions? Um, so yes, there um, is. The first family um, of um, glutamine synthase. So glutamine synthase is an enzyme um, which is involved in proline production. And it's a um, production of a proline that is um, based on arginine derived from the host tissues um, and has been already researched in platy helminths. Um, it's also implicated in modifying host antioxidant defenses and it is a marker of glial cells which are immune cells of the nervous system. And these have been found um, uh, to be enriched or duplicated um, in uh, parasites that uh, affect the host uh, behavior, uh, such as Microphallus papillorobustus or Trichobacarthia. The second family was a little bit more enigmatic. There is not uh, so much known about this family and not much can be inferred about its function without experimental evidence. But we know that the um, enzyme is implicated in DNA repair and metallopeptidase is, um, uh -huh. so metallohydrolase is, um, is a metallopeptidase and has been um, implicated in other uh, parasites such as the nematode strongloides papillosis in um, host tissue digestion. So um, I just want to thank you um, for listening. Thank the organizers uh, for this great session and um, uh, I want to thank Natasha Glover especially for, for this work that I was able to do with her, um, Christoph Desimos and David Moore as well from University of Lausanne and Hannah Hartikainen and Stefan Sauer and Yuka Jokola from ETH Zurich and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much Natalia for a, a lovely talk. Um, there's there's one oh we have two questions from the audience um, maybe we'll be able to uh, address at least one of them so firstly um, uh, 31 out of 31 genes under positive selection in a HOG seems like a lot which model did you use in PAML and which percent of the other HOGs had positive selection with the same model so um, it is what we did was we reconstructed first the gene tree um, for this family uh, with IQ tree, uh, maximum likelihood um, tree. And we then um, used the uh, branch site model in CODAMEL uh, to detect um, branches under uh, positive selection. So uh, we know we have detected positive selection on all the branches that we've tested. Um, but um, uh, the mostly we focused on the branches that led to the expansion of of the um, of the genes in Atrophella forest. Thanks. Um, I think we might have time for one more question um, uh, from Julian. Uh, immune related genes and peptides. Uh, peptidases are usual hits in positive selection screens. Do you think that something special happens in your system more than in other sister groups? Um, you mean for the metallopeptidase? Is that the, is the question about, it's peptidase in general. So I guess it's referring to, to that. Um, so I feel that, that it is um, a little bit different because in this gene family, there were about one to five genes um, from other trematodes and our uh, trematode had um, a massive expansion um, uh, of this gene family uh, with 35 or 31 genes in it. So I guess it is a little bit different, uh, um, but nothing can be said without experimental evidence and further um, research into that. Thank you. So we are going to, to move to Alejandro Vecano uh, from the group, the group of Joshua Payne, who is going to uh, talk about modeling the effects of mutation bias on adaptive evolution. Uh, yep. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the, for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I would like to start 
by posing a question that has been recently regaining some attention. That is, what is the role of mutation bias in adaptation? And the answer is, well, it depends. Mainly on, first, on one hand, population dynamics conditions. More specifically, on the mutation supply. In the, in the low mutation supply scenario, mutations are so rare that, ben that the beneficial mutations that are more likely to occur due to a mutation bias are the ones more likely to go to fixation. But in contrast, in the high mutation supply scenario, mutations arise so frequently that it's more likely for selection to choose the beneficial mutations with the highest selection coefficients instead of the ones favored by mutation bias. On the other hand, uh, the shape of the distribution of fitness effects can also limit the role of mutation bias. For instance, in cases in which the number of beneficial mutations in a given environment is very low. So in order to quantify the effect of mutation bias, the main idea is that we need two ingredients. First, the mutation spectrum of a given species as an output of some study like a mutation accumulation experiment, for instance. And second, a very large set of bona fide adaptive point mutations of the same species, but that comes from a totally different experiment. We could sort of data in such a way that we can count the number of times a point mutation um, from each codon to a given amino acid happens, okay? And then the idea is to use a generalized linear model to predict the expected number of events of the adaptive codon to amino acid exchanges while being completely agnostic about the selection coefficients of such mutations. That means that our model only depends on the number of times the codon appears in the, in the genome and its probability to mutate to a given amino acid. Then we can use regression to determine the value of beta that will give us information about the contribution of this mutation term to the expected number of adapted events we, we see in the data set. Okay, so we did this for three different species. And then you can also see the number of adapted mutations or adapted events that we use for, for the regressions. And this is what we got. So surprisingly, the mutation term parameters seem to be relevant and significant for all species. However, when we quantify the correlation between the observed, uh, the observed adapted events and the ones predicted by the model, we see quite a difference across species. So in order to make more sense about these results, we decided to generate synthetic data using SLIM. That is a very efficient evolutionary simulation framework um, that I do not have the time to go into the details about all the simulations, but basically we are able to construct synthetic data sets under a different population genetic uh, conditions. So here are the results of the regressions for, for these uh, synthetic data sets um, for different population sizes. So since the mutation rate is fixed, Every time we increase the population size, we're increasing the number of mutants in the population. So we're increasing the mutation supply, basically. You can see here how the influence of the mutation term in the regression decreases as the mutation supply gets higher. And similarly, the correlation between the observed events and the predicted adapted events vanishes as, as mutation supply uh, increases. So we can conclude that Low mutation supply favors the fixation of the mutations that are more likely to occur, showing like a first come first serve dynamics. And when this is the case, we can make better prediction of the adapted mutations, um, knowing uh, the mutation spectrum of the species. So basically the take home messages quickly summarized are that first we can quantify the influence of mutation bias and adaptive evolution using generalized linear models. And in addition, we see that mutation bias influences the genetic changes that drive adaptation under a range of population genetic conditions, particularly when mutations are rare. So in this low mutation supply um, regime. In the future, we hope to get, to get a better understanding of the role of the distribution of fitness effects in this modeling, uh, in this modeling framework. And, and with that, I, I would like to thank you again for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. So, Antendi, you will be able to ask your questions to Alejandro uh, during the meeting speaker session. And we Thanks. are now <laughs> we are now going to move and to hear uh, Julia Pereshka from the group of uh, Maria Anisimova.
and she's going to talk about the impact of MDRT ATB strain, background and transmission fitness loss. Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me okay. And let me start my presentation. All right, so I'm going to talk about the work I was doing for my PhD actually in the group of Tanya Stadler. This time. Um, and just to demystify the title a little bit, uh, MDRTB stands for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And first things first, just to tell you why we want to walk uh, to work on tuberculosis in the first place. Something that people tell me a lot is, isn't to be eradicated. Well, unfortunately not. It is one of the top three infectious disease death, death causes worldwide. I guess, unfortunately, this may change in the, well, in the near future uh, because of COVID, but so far this is the case. It is a very slow evolving bacterium, which actually has certain implications, which I will talk about in a second. And it also has tree-like evolution, which is very helpful for any kind of phylogenetic and phylodynamic methods um, that we may want to apply. So what would we like to do is we would like to estimate drug resistant transmission fitness. So how much fitter or how much less fit are drug resistant strains uh, in comparison to more drug sensitive ones. But if we think about the types of drug resistance that are present, one of them could be transmitted drug resistance where a single individual or single patient acquires drug resistance after treating, after treatment, and then goes on to spread that drug resistance to other patients. Another option would be to have acquired drug resistance um, where different patients in, independently acquire drug resistance on their own. However, what we actually mostly get isn't this full beautiful picture with the histories of how drug resistance appears. And actually, we think about it, what we do in fact get is just the dots, not even the trees themselves. And this is also kind of the traditional epidemiological approach where you look at your samples at a different points in time. So you look at the uh, prevalence, for example, so you know how many drug resistant, how drug, many drug sensitive strains there are, but you don't know the evolutionary relationships between them. So this is what we're trying to address. So what we would like to do is we would like to take uh, drug resistant and drug sensitive strains of tuberculosis, take their ge genetic data and their drug resistant statuses together with the sample dates, and then use phylodynamics to estimate the relative transmission fitness. So we want to focus on relative transmission fitness because that would allow us to compare different strains between uh, locations. So if we know that a certain drug resistance gives us a fitness cost in comparison to a more drug sensitive strain, we would be able to look at the same um, drug resistances in different, in different locations, for example. However, the one big problem that comes from the fact that TB is a very slow evolving bacterium is that there is actually basically very little collection of drug sensitive strains. For the longest time, we actually thought that it's mainly clonal, so there isn't much variation in there. So we actually don't even have the samples that we need for analysis. So instead, what we opted for doing is we opted for estimating there's many, many, many samples for multi-drug resistance strains, strains that are resistant to at least two of the first line drugs. So we opted for estimated transmission fitness of an additional drug resistance on top of that. And that particular drug is called pyrazinamide or PCA for short. So when we're looking at the, at the data set that we had from Georgia, when we look at the sequence data and analyze it to get our transmission fitness costs, we actually see that there is a, about a 35% fitness loss uh, for the drug resistance. So the drug resistance strain, more drug resistance strain will spread less. However, we decided to also see what happens if we remove the genetic data from the picture. This would be kind of an approximation of more traditional epidemiological approaches. So what happens is we actually greatly overestimate the transmission fitness cost. So we see more than 50% reduction in spread. This basically tells us that it is very dangerous to not look at the genetic data, and we basically face the danger of overestimating the fitness cost and underestimating the danger of drug resistance strains of tuberculosis. Moreover, we actually got, well, we had other data sets available. So when we were looking, this is the data set that we had available first from Kinshasa and Lineage 4, one of the main lineages of tuberculosis. Um, and we kind of have, we got a result that's very compliant with the general expectation in the field. The pyrazinamide resistance knocks out a gene, so it causes a fitness loss. However, when you look at a different data set from Georgia, which is a different lineage, of course, we already see that we actually don't see that much of a fitness loss. And this could be discounted on the fact that it's a different lineage. However, when we look at the same lineage from 
as from Kinshasa, the lineage four in Georgia, not only we do not really see a fitness cost, well, we cannot really rule out a fitness advantage either. So these are the main conclusions from that. And actually in my future work, what I would like to address most is the data collection. And while we did communicate with some of the people who were collecting the data, there's still not enough data on the sensitive strains that we would need to perform the analysis that we want. So I would like to really foster better communication between different fields and different scientists to make sure that the data that is collected is what is most useful. Um, however, the other thing that has always been my little bit of a pet peeve is that most of the time when we do uh, tree inference on certain data, it's done on a multiple sequence alignment, which has been inferred based on some sort of a guide tree. So this is actually what I will be working now or have been for the past three months in Maria Nisimova's group, uh, which is simultaneous multiple sequence alignment and tree inference under an indel model. So this is my future work and thank you very much for listening. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. So we're running a little bit out of time. So now we are going to listen Victor Rossier from the group of Christophe Decimus, who is going to explain us uh, why phylogeny-driven and alignment-free protein family uh, assignment is an accurate and scalable alternative to methods relying merely on closest sequence. So hi, everyone. Oh, yeah. Share this. Okay, thanks for the introduction. And let's start then. Okay, so this is a gene tree that depicts the evolutionary history of a gene. And together, all these genes form the gene family. So you might have noticed here that some of the genes belong to the same species. And this is because, unlike species, genes do undergo duplication events. And therefore, this leads to multiple copies of the same genes per species. So to have a finer grain classification of these genes, you can define gene subfamilies. And the gene subfamilies do carry important information, such as uh, their function. So here, myoglobin is really specialized for the storage of oxygen in the muscles, while hemoglobin is there to transport oxygen in the blood. <clears throat> so you might understand that if you are interested in functional annotation, for example, you must consider gene subfamilies. So this brings us to the challenge that we are trying to tackle in that study, <clears throat> which is to assign some unknown protein sequences to this hierarchy of gene family and subfamilies. So someone could ask, basically, can't we simply use the same subfamily as its closest sequence with tools such as BLAST, for example? So in that example, the striped line depicts the true location of the query was while the star is the closest sequence location. On that example, it looks fine because both belong to the, this hemoglobin subfamily and therefore it would be fine to use the closest sequence here. However, in, it is not always the case. So in that second example, the query has diverged before the duplication and therefore its closest sequence is located in a different subfamily. So then we have quantified this scenario where the closest sequence would mislead the query in another specific subfamily. So here you have on the y-axis the fraction of queries that belongs either to the same or a different subfamily than its closest sequence. And the key information here is that up to two-thirds of closest sequence belongs to a different subfamily than their queries. So to address that problem, we have developed a new method, which is OMAMER, and it uses some phylogenetic information and also an alignment-free measure and tries to make more precise assignments. So here I will show you the key algorithmic ID behind this method. So the goal really is given a query is to place, is to find out where in a reference uh, hierarchy of family and subfamily it has diverged from. So whether it has diverged from the green orange or the purple branches here. So for that, we extract the subsequence of that query and compare it against uh, the reference sequences. So for that first example, so this subsequence or KMER is actually informative to the orange subfamily and this is simply because it is shared with one of the reference sequence. But the trick comes when 
um, subsequence is actually shared between more than one subfamily. And here, Omamer will consider these two subsequences to be homologous. And therefore, because they it, this subsequence originated before the duplication, it is informative to the green family. So you can imagine that by combining multiple of these gamers or subsequences, you can make precise assignments. And this is what we have shown with a benchmark against a closest sequence approach. And so this is a precision recall curve. And the first thing I observe is that Omamer makes very precise assignments. And this is because when you vary the score threshold in, uh, in Omamer, you actually make assignments to more or less specific families. And by contrast, the closest sequence is always bound to the same subfamily. So then we compared also the accuracy, so the trade-off between precision and recall. And this is usually equivalent between both approaches. And finally, the real added value of that method is that it's very fast because it's an alignment-free algorithm, and also it's very scalable. Um, we have compared Omamer against a very fast alternative to BLAST, which is Diamond, and we have shown that we can classify up to above 200 sequences per second, and this regardless of the number of reference genomes. And this is because when you add a new genome, you don't necessarily add new subfamilies or families, but you still have to make many more comparisons with Diamond, for example. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, very much, uh, Victor. And uh, attendees, please all keep your questions for the next speaker for our little session. Uh, so now we are going to move to Mathilde Foglierini from the group of uh, Luciano Gatium. And she's going to, to talk about ancestry and interactive immunoglobulin lineage tree visualizer. Um, hello. Uh, so let me share. So it's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I'm uh, Mathilde. I'm a bioinformatician at IRB in Ticino. And uh, today I will uh, present you Ancestry. It's a software I develop uh, to um, display immunoglobulin lineage tree. So first of all, just a brief introduction about uh, antibodies. So um, basically, when you have the B cell before uh, secreting the antibody, it will display the antibody on its uh, surface. And an antibody is composed of two heavy chain and two light chain. And um, you will have the antigens that will bind to the antibody uh, on the top of it. So this region is called the variable region. And uh, the antigen will uh, fix more specifically into the CDR regions that are composed of uh, loops. So if we just uh, have a closer uh, look on this uh, variable region, so you have the heavy chain on the top and the light chain on the bottom, and the CDR regions that are along the sequences. So in the germinal center, um, in order to increase the affinity of your antibody with the antigen, you will have um, a set of uh, mutations that will occur uh, preferentially into the CDR region and that will allow the antibody to increase affinities with antigen. So this is called uh, affinity uh, maturation and these mutations are called uh, somatic hypermutation. So this is what, why we develop uh, Ancestry. In, it was to have um, a closer look of this uh, somatic hypermutation events in um, clonal family of immunoglobulin of interest. So <clears throat> Ancestry is developed uh, in uh, Java. It can work in, uh, with two kinds of inputs. So the first one is when you have um, a clonal family of interest uh, against uh, um, an antigen. Um, so all the sequences are related. So basically, you just uh, infer the common ancestor using some um, bioinformatics uh, tools specific for this. And then after uh, sequence alignment, you use uh, DNA ML and uh, it will infer a phylogenic tree. And the DNA ML output text file can be used as uh, input into Ancestry. So the second way to use uh, Ancestry is uh, through the incantation workflow. So this is uh, when you've done some um, repertoire analysis, we call. So this is high throughput sequencing of antibody sequences. And um, so there are uh, this um, very nice software that is called Chenjo that will do the clonal clustering of your um, clonal family. 
and you also uh, you also infer the common ancestor of each coronal family, and <clears throat> they also develop um, um, this uh, algorithm that is called IGFIML. That it's an algorithm uh, specific for an immunoglobulin to infer a phylogenetic tree. So at the end, you have um, a set of output files that can be used as uh, input into Ancestry. So in both ways, Ancestry will um, just display a graphic user interface, uh, which is mainly um, so the phylogenetic tree of your family of interest, which is um, the tree is interactive. And um, also, you have some uh, specific uh, features uh, such as uh, sequence alignment, um, which in this case, you have the common ancestor on the top of the alignment. And um, yeah, Ancestry will also create an XML file that can also be directly uploaded to Ancestry later on. And so now let's take a steady case. Um, so we took this um, antibody sequences. Uh, from um, uh, the paper, I'm sorry. And um, so it's uh, six antibody sequences that are against the fusion protein of the RSV uh, virus. And as you can see, there is um, uh, one uh, antibody that has a, a lower affinity compared to the other one. So um, we made um, the clonal uh, family and the, we infer the tree of this clonal family. So this is a graph interface of ancestry. And as you can see straight away, the, um, the guy I was talking about with the lower affinity is already apart in the tree. So you have the possibility to interact with the tree, like if you click on each node, you have access to the sequences, also some um, uh, features specific to antibodies. And as you can see also, uh, between each node, uh, we write the number. So the first number is the number of nucleotide mutation, and uh, the second one is the number of amino acid mutation. So here you can see that all the antibody sequences here share a common mutation here. So if you click on it, um, you see uh, what is the nucleotide mutation and the amino acid mutation. That you see this one occurs into the CDR1 uh, region, and here you can extrapolate that this mutation is probably responsible for better affinity with a fusion protein of RSV. And Another way also to see this uh, share mutation is through the sequence alignment, which is very handy. You can see straight away the, the share mutation. So please go to my uh, GitHub um, web page where you can download the program. It's a jar file. It's very easy to install, and there is all the documentation. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Mathilde. So now we are going to move to uh, Diana Ivet Cruz uh, Davalos from the group of Anna Safo Malaspinas. And she's going to talk about unseen un population genomics of Brazilian Bodokudo groups. Thank so. you. Uh, so today I'm presenting some results of my PhD project. And the question I'm introducing is who are the Bodokudos? So by the beginning of my PhD, I learned that Botocudo was a label given by European colonizers to some groups in Brazil who shared some characteristics. And what, some of these characteristics are that they, they had a lifestyle as hunter-gatherers and they were wearing these wooden discs in ears and lips. Also, some paleontologists uh, some anthropologists have called uh, our attention by mentioning that these individuals have a special type of craniometry that's common among ancient people in the Americas, and it's called Paleoamerican craniometry. Uh, an example of a population having this type of craniometry is the Lagoa Santa people, who I will refer to as ancient Brazilians in this talk. Uh, their remains have been found around Brazil, about 10,000 years old. And if you're more interested, I recommend you to look for the Lucia woman. So uh, due to this uh, characteristic in these groups, it's been, uh, uh, the anthropologists have wondered whether these Botocudo people have a special link to the Lagoa Santa population. Uh, but besides this point, there is little that we know about the Botocudo groups. Uh, most of our knowledge comes from the contact with the European people and actually uh, due to several conflicts with the colonizers, they became, they were exterminated by the beginning of the 19th century. 
So in our project, we established a collaboration with the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro. They have uh, 35 schools that were labeled as Botucudo. And we are analyzing 22 individuals from this collection. They also provided samples for two other individuals that don't have this label of Botocudo. And we started by radiocarbon dating these uh, samples. And it turns out that the uh, individuals of unknown affiliations are a bit older. So they probably die before a contact between Brazil and Europe that is set at 1500. Whereas the other individuals of the Potocudo collection uh, died probably in more recent times, all of them after a contact with uh, Europe in 1500. So the next thing we did was to sequence uh, the DNA of the 24 individuals mapped to a reference genome and compute the depth of coverage. And here I'm showing you the depth of coverage. Each dot is a sample so that you know the type of data, data we are working with. Most of them are at 1x or below. Uh, but there is one sample here uh, that is at 24x, which is quite good for a, an ancient DNA uh, project. And before I jump into the results of comparing the DNA of these individuals to other groups, I want to let you know that in 2014, my supervisor already analyzed two individuals of the collection that I'm not including here. And also we expected them to be Native Americans. What the, she and her colleagues found is that these individuals that are here uh, were actually Polynesians. So what I did first was to screen my, uh, this data set for outliers such as Polynesians. And remember, we have 24 individuals. This is the coverage. And I'm comparing here two groups from other places in the world, Africa, Europe, etc. What's important is that we have Polynesian groups and we have Native American groups here in purple. So the Polynesians are grouping here. And in black, I have these dots that are the individuals from 2014. So I'm recovering the signal, that's good. And uh, in black, I have my samples. So let me tell you what happens. When I compare them to the, uh, this data set, what I observe is that all the individuals are grouping with Native Americans. So uh, there is not a clear outlier in this data set. Uh, here's the result, so that you believe me. And I still recover the Polynesians from 2014. Our individual seems to seem to be Native Americans, but now we wonder whether they could still be admixed with Polynesians or other people that became in contact with the Americans, uh, with the Native Americans in recent times. And the answer is that uh, by doing an admixture analysis, I don't find any a signal of admixture with Polynesian or other people out of the Americas. So once uh, we knew that our new data was from Native Americans, we decided to model the ancestry of these individuals. But now with a, uh, in, the, uh, in the peopling of the Americas, trying to compare them to what we know. So we took uh, whole genomes from modern and ancient uh, populations. Some of them are quite old, 24,000 years old, and some of them are a few hundred years old here in red. Uh, so here I'm showing the relationship between these genomes as far as we know. And now here this dot is to show you the ancestry that is shared by Native Americans. So I will just try to complete this graph and showing you there are some splits going on here, 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 then some here. So this is the ancient Brazilians I was mentioning, the Lagoa Santa. Uh, now I have a Mexican genome here, the Mije. Also, I refer to this genome as Mesoamerican genome. And we need another branch coming somewhere here because there is not a good genome that uh, is explaining this stream of ancestry in this population. It comes from something that we call a ghost population. Um, now, also something that we know to explain the ancestry of the Lagoa Santa 
is that they received some uh, input from a population related to Australasians. And this is something that so far has been found only in this population and a few other modern populations around Brazil, still puzzling, and we don't have a really good explanation on how this could happen. So now the question I have is, where can I add our population, the Botafudos, in this graph? And we uh, brown some models and compare them. And I'm explaining here uh, three equally likely models, our best models to explain the ancestry of this group. So in all the three models, I need an input of Mesoamerican ancestry. So something that's related to this Mexican genome that I have here. And this uh, stream of ancestry branches out somewhere here. here. So this is common to the three models. Now I also need, uh, in the first and second model I have listed here, we need an input of an ancient Brazilian population. They are, so in this regard, these two models are similar, but there is a slight difference. So I will put the first model in blue here, and the second model in blue here. And I hope you see that the difference between these two models is when the branch is uh, diverging in this tree, in this topology. So in one case, the branch comes before this uh, Lagoa Santa population receives some inputs from the Australasian group here. And in the second case, it comes after the, this branch has received the Australasian component. So that's the main difference between these two models. And in the third model, uh, to explain the ancestry of the Potocudos, we need something similar like what happened with the Mexican genome, an input of ancestry from a ghost population for which we don't have a good genome to explain this ancestry. So uh, these are three good models and they are non-mutually exclusive. And with this, I want to close uh, this talk. Just to remind you, we have a new data set of samples. They are all Native Americans. They seem not to be descendants of the ancient populations in the area, the Lagoa Santa, because in addition to this component, we need uh, some Mesoamerican ancestry and probably a ghost population. This all needs to be further assessed. And I want to thank all, uh, all our collaborators, uh, people in my lab, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Tiana, for an amazing talk. And um, one of the first uh, uh, non-questions that I got was um, uh, just a commendation on the innovative uh, presentation style. Um, but we, we have a question here from uh, Julian, um, who asks, uh, what about, oh, um, that's your time. <laughs> um, yeah. What about these two uh, Botacudo individuals from the 2014 study? Why were they assigned as 100% Polynesian? Yes, so uh, this was an admixture analysis and they were compared to people from uh, all over the world. So this was a simplified view. They have East Asians, Siberians, Native Americans and Polynesians. And you just run the, uh, this program, you compare to the genomes of, of these populations and you observe that uh, the genome is simply similar to that of the Polynesians in this group. So they, they are of Polynesian ancestry and not Native Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and now we are going to move to the last talk of this session, uh, which will be presented by Tristan Kummer from the Jérôme Boudet group and is going to tell us about the genomic tales and the story of European barn owl. So hello everybody, uh, thank you for being here. So as Gwen said, uh, my name is Tristan Kummer and I'm a postdoc in Jean Boudet's group in the University of Lausanne. And today I'm going to present you a part of a large project based on barn owl genomics. And I will focus on the history of this burn in Europe. So what you may know and what you can see, well, what, yeah, what you can see on this map 
is that uh, nowadays barn owl is a cosmopolitan bird with a wide distribution all over Europe and around the Mediterranean Sea. And what you probably also know is that during the last glacial period, which occurred between 20 and 50,000 years ago, most of the European continent was under ice or the ground was frozen almost all the year, meaning that many species and um, most of the species uh, had to refuge somewhere south, uh, somewhere in the south. And it's illustrated on this map where you can see that trees are around the Mediterranean Sea while the northern part of Europe is classified as tundra or ice. So then with the climate warming, this population reconquisted Europe via different routes and these different lineages may meet and admix. So if we actually know the history of this recolonization for many species, the history is still not clear for the bound owl. So to try to answer this question, we sequenced whole genome for about 100 individuals from 11 populations, and they represent the actual repartition of the bird in Europe. And the common kind of analysis that may be done with such kind of information is to study the genetic structure of the population. So this may be done using many methods, and the one I will present today is to use the genetic clustering method, which allows to visualize the genetic ancestry of individuals. To do so, genetic diversity observed in all the individuals is used to infer the genetic properties of K ancestral population, and then individuals are assigned to these clusters. This means that they may either be direct descendant from only one of these ancestral population, or they can also be the results of the admixture of these different clusters. So here on this map, you have the result for K equal three in the European bound owl. So on this map, each pie is an individual and the different colors indicate the contribution from the different ancestral population. So what we can observe is that we have the three main clusters, the three main colors that are geographically distributed. We can see that the yellow cluster is spread from Iberic Peninsula to the northern part of Europe. We can see a green cluster, which is in the actual Italian Greece and the purple cluster, which is the only one present in the Near East region. But we, what we can also observe is that from the northern population uh, of Europe, and especially here in Serbia, we can see that we have contribution of both green and yellow cluster and these individuals. And one last point that we can observe in this map is that our Portuguese samples do have some contribution of this purple uh, cluster. So from these results, we can start to build a scenario for the barn owl in Europe. One hypothesis that we may formulate is that during the last glacial maximum, barn owl were isolated into three main places. The first one, let's say in the Iberic Peninsula or somewhere in this region, a second one between Greece and Italy, and a third one in the Near East. And our results suggest that barn owl mostly reconquested Europe via the, this yellow cluster. And because this is the main, uh, this is a cluster most present in all population above the Alp. But we may also hypothesize that uh, the Greco-Italian lineages follow the Danube to conquer the Angaria plains where the two lineages seems to meet and hybridize. And the presence of the purple cluster in Portuguese sample may reflect some gene flow from the north of Africa, maybe during the last glaciation, but we still need to make some analysis to confirm that. So obviously all these results are preliminary, and well, it's just one, one results, but I hope you enjoy this short presentation. If you have any question, feel free to ask me any question. And I would just take two seconds to thank everybody involved in this project, the organizer of the session, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan. So um, I want to thank all the speakers for this really great talks. And thank you for uh, everything. And now we are going to move to the uh, meet the speaker session. And we'll be able to ask all the questions I'm sure you have. <laughs>